that story talks back. Almost everything that we remember, think about, or imagine is a story. Stories entertain us, inform us, and even define us. They have upsides, and they have downsides. This podcast explores the power of story in every aspect of our lives. I'm Dave Stanton. Thank you for joining us. At the age of 22, Glenn Gould burst onto the global music scene, an instant star thanks to his virtuoso recording of a then-obscure Bach work, The Goldberg Variations. And from the beginning, Gould was not just a musician, but a character who might have stepped from the pages of a novel, cheerfully eccentric, an admitted hypochondriac who wore scarves in the summertime, and a loner who preferred to sleep during the day and work through the night. Doing things differently seemed to make life more interesting for Gould's restless mind. He chose an often surprising repertoire, and after a relatively short touring career, gave up concerts altogether in 1964, an extraordinary decision that placed him on an almost singular path among classical artists. He invented a fascinating and challenging form of radio documentary, which he called contrapuntal radio, and produced numerous programs for the CBC in this format. He won four Grammy Awards during his lifetime, composed his own string quartet, and wrote dozens of essays. In 1982, not long after recording a widely praised reinterpretation of the Goldberg Variations, and just two days past his 50th birthday, Gould suffered a devastating stroke. He died about a week later, on October 4th. It was the end of a singular life, career, and story. In this special edition of The Story Talks Back, Gould's friend and collaborator, the Pulitzer Prize-winning critic Tim Page, talks to us about Gould as story and storyteller. Recalling his face-to-face interview with Gould just weeks before the pianist's death, as well as their hours-long phone conversations, Gould's prescient desire to give listeners more control in the creative process, and much more. Page is the editor of the Glenn Gould Reader, an indispensable collection of the pianist's written work, and the author of a memoir, Parallel Play. He has also edited an anthology of the great critic Virgil Thompson, and published a biography of the New York novelist Dawn Powell, almost single-handedly reviving interest in her work. Page is a dean among classical music critics, with notable stints at the Soho Weekly News, Newsday, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, where he won the Pulitzer Prize in Criticism in 1997. He is an emeritus professor of musicology at the University of Southern California and continues to write about music and culture for The Washington Post and other publications. So, Tim, it's great to welcome you back to The Story Talks Back. It's wonderful to be back. Good to to, see you, Dave. To talk about Glenn Gould. And I've got on my my Gould duds for you today on a very hot day. Um, <laughs> you look good. Glenn would approve. <laughs> um, so uh, you're going to be actually doing, you, you were close friends with Glenn and also his collaborator. And you're going to be doing some talks about him coming up, right? I am. I'm going to be going to Boston and then to Toronto and then back to New York and then finally uh, going to Amsterdam. So uh, it's going to be fun and I'm I'm really looking forward to it. You know, it's it's strange because most of Glenn's friends were older than he was. And considering we're talking about his 90th birthday, I am, uh, you know, I, I'm now 67, but you know, it's, it's just very strange to think of this because I'm one of the last people who really knew him pretty well. Mm. And there's still so much interest in him. I mean, he's, he's possibly more popular today than he ever was. He's permanent. He's definitely permanent. Um, 
So I want to talk to you about him in relationship to stories. And I think there's a lot of ways where uh, his, you know, his career and his life sort of intersect with stories. Um, so I wonder if you could sort of start by telling us a little of his childhood story, like his personal story, you know, growing up and, and what his what his sort of formative years were like. Sure. Um, Glenn was born in what was then a sort of not far distant suburb, but not right on top of Toronto um, in an area called the Beaches. And he was the son of a mother who was, um, for the time, quite elderly. She was in her 40s. I can't remember exactly how old she is now, was now. But, um, and, you know, I remember Glenn's father saying that Glenn was an answer to prayer. Uh, I never met his mother, but uh, he he grew up in this sort of nice, you know, area of the suburbs. It now feels almost like downtown Toronto, but, uh, and he showed enormous talent from a very, very young age. Um, and then his mother started teaching him and she was really the main teacher in his life. Um, and he, you know, he was remarkable and he, he, entered conservatory when he was about 10 or 11 and graduated he was the youngest and the most honored student at the royal conservatory of music and i think wow. he graduated 14 and soon he was playing all over you know canada and became quite famous in canada um and then um he came to the United States. He actually made his American debut in Washington at, at the Phillips Collection. And then he came and played at Town Hall, both of these in January of 1955. And uh, his, his, um, his concert in Washington, Paul Hume, who was the music critic of the Washington Post for many, many years, mm -hmm. on January 2nd said, it's early in the year for these kinds of predictions, but I can't believe we'll hear a better pianist this year, or words to that effect. Mm -hmm. um, Columbia Masterworks signed him right up, and Glenn insisted upon recording the Goldberg Variations. Now, we have to go back a bit. Um, it was considered a rather um, unusual and academic and not a particularly popular piece when Glenn played it. There'd been two earlier recordings, one on uh, harpsichord and one on um, piano. I think there were only two, mm -hmm. but Glenn insisted upon the Goldberg variations and he made that recording and uh, it has never been out of print in the almost 70 years, the 67 years since it came out. And um, it was beautiful. It was exciting. Everybody was thrilled with this young pianist from the North. Um, and um, I'm probably giving you too much for an introduction here. We should talk about some things in between. But uh, it made the Goldberg variations very famous indeed. It made it actually popular. Um, and it made Glenn's name pretty much overnight. Uh, and so here's this kid of 22, and all of a sudden he's, you know, the, the big excitement in the music world. Yeah, and, and, you know, just from that amazing, great, great little story. Thank you, Tim. My um, pleasure. You know, there's, there's, first of all, you see immediately that there's this kind of aura around him you know that he's almost like a shaman or you know something kind of magical and untouchable about his talent and uh and it, is, it seemed like something that you know even he didn't feel like he understood you know like he didn't like to talk about how he played you know he didn't like to talk yeah. about uh the pianistic technique um, you know, he was once actually asked if he could teach, and he said it would be like that old legend about the centipede, that the moment the centipede tried consciously to do what it was doing naturally, it could no longer do it. And um, Glenn felt that way. Right. And it's it seems like, you know, when you think about some pianists 
seem so vanilla, you know, in terms of their personalities and their stories. I mean, Glenn's story was always so rich, you know, and kind of mystical. Um, it, it's, it's probably something that he never set out to create, but it just assembled around him. Did you have that sense? Well, um, yes and no. I think Glenn used to say even early on that he knew how to cut the story to fit the, you know, the newsstand on the corner. So, so it's a good thing that we're talking about stories because Glenn realized that people were fascinated by him and he, you know, he'd say some outrageous things every now and then, which would just get more people interested to agree or disagree. And then, then again, it has to be remembered, he was a very beautiful young man. You know, he had, he had hair that was, I mean, you, you look back at the pictures from the early sessions and I'm old enough to remember when the Beatles came along in 1964, when they first played the States. Um, and it was really a strange thing because Glenn's hair was longer than the Beatles hair. And this was about nine <laughs> years before they landed, you know, um, he, you know, and he, he hunched over and he sang while he played. And he, he said that he'd love to get rid of that, but he always felt that there was just nothing going on unless he was responding to the music in his own ecstatic way. So, um, uh, so yeah, there's a story. I, I think Glenn certainly didn't mind nudging the story along a bit, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. And and then of course he quit playing when he was 31. Right. So so you know, it, all of a sudden it was like, now what's that crazy person doing? But you know, if you look at his reasons for quitting, they were all really completely logical. You know, it was just. It was just the thing that he felt he needed to do. And going back to sort of those early, you know, that those first sessions in New York City when he was recording, you know, Goldberg Variations and Don Hunstein was taking those photos that are on the album itself. Yeah. That you can see that he's kind of disheveled, you know, his, his clothes are almost too big for him, his hair's everywhere. And it kind of seemed like the more you know, kind of messy and uh, almost bizarre that he became, the more people talked about him and loved him. Well, he was breaking a lot of rules, you know, especially when he quit the stage. But even before that, you know, he played in his own chair because he thought that made him the most comfortable. And he also wanted to play the music that he really cared about. I mean, uh, you know, he always said that he didn't like Chopin. And I suppose, you know, that's probably true. He certainly didn't like to play Chopin much. Mm. And the one recording of that we have of a major Chopin work is, is frankly terrible. And Glenn used to say, well, I did my worst. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was not released during his lifetime. But, you know, if somebody expected Rachmaninoff or Chopin, in no way am I putting these people down. That was not what you got from Glenn Gould. You got Svelink and you got Albon Berg and you got, um, you know, and you got uh, unusual Bach. It wasn't just the, you know, the Italian concerto or the partitas or something. It was the Goldberg Variations which was, you know, considered way out there back then. Um, so, so yeah, he, you know, it, it, he, what, what he did was he made, I mean, I, I want to be careful with this because I think classical music is intrinsically interesting. Usually um, certainly a great deal of it is certainly the best is, but he made, he made, um, classical music and especially piano music um let, let's put it this way if you were alive in the 50s and you were reading your Camus and your Sartre and watching your Bergman films and fascinated by Bobby Fischer the chances were that you were also utterly fascinated by Glenn Gould he was an intellectuals pianist um uh, which, which is interesting because some of the more intellectual musicians tended to be the people who weren't 
that fond of his work, you know. Um, but people who were not ordinarily ordinarily interested in classical music found themselves very interested in Glenn Gould. So right. you know, and and it is complicated. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just one of those things. I mean, I think you know, he probably rightly assessed that the story could draw people in in a way that maybe the music couldn't, you know, or the, the once they got to the music, they could appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, I I, I think that's the case. Um, and, you know, he was also, you know, he felt very driven to do what he did, you know, for, for Glenn, it was not just to be about being a superstar pianist and, you know, getting a lot of people interested in you that way. He really wanted to play this music. He had ideas about it and he was going to play it his way and he was going to play his music his way. And that's what he did pretty much through his lifetime. I will jump a few decades though quickly now, because I think it's appropriate and say that I think Glenn would have loved the internet. I think he would have loved being able to make his own recordings by himself on his computer, you know, re recording on his own machines. And then he he also, you know, he used to say when when he was going to do the Emperor Concerto with Leopold Stokowski, he said that the one thing he wanted to do was either do the fastest version ever made or the slowest version. And, and this wasn't just to be you know, bad boy. He he really thought that it was interesting in both those ways. And what he didn't want to do was the standard emperor concerto. And so he and Stokowski finally agreed on the slowest. Um, and, you know, a lot of people were very shocked by that. But um, what Glenn, I think if he had lived and been able to make recordings I think he would have done several versions of the same piece so right. that if you woke up one morning and you wanted to hear a slow Glenn Gould recording of this, you could play a slow Glenn Gould recording of this. But if you wanted to change it around or say if you liked the third movement in a different way, he liked the idea of engaging the listener. And he, he wrote a very interesting essay, one of his very best, called The Prospects of Recording, right. where he talks all about the amazing ability we would someday have. And of course it came to pass, but it came to pass after he died. But Glenn would have, I think, dropped the regular record company and would have made his own records and put them out on online. And, you know, it would have been fascinating. Right. No, and he also, I think, and that that essay was in your, you know, totally amazing book, the Glenn Gould. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Yeah, the, I think it's too long. No, it's, you know, we, we, we the didn't, Gould book. well, it's the Gould book because we tried to get everything in there. If I were redoing it and if I knew that there were going to hold, going to be a whole ton of Glenn Gould books, I would have made it shorter and I would have concentrated on the very best of his work. I think there's a little too much about certain composers in there and I would have probably cut that out. But, you know, I was working with the estate and the idea was, well, it's going to be the Glenn Gould reader, so you should get everything in. Well, first of all, we found a whole lot more in the years since he died. But but secondly, for me, I would like to do the book as at, at least some version of the book as about a 250, 300 page book rather than the, the 500 it took. Because I do think there are, are things in there that Glenn probably would say, oh no, I don't think that's as good as I said it in this piece. And then you find that piece immediately after the piece that I think he might not have liked so much. Right. And it's interesting too, because in that essay, I think it's the same essay, he also talks about the listener creating their own version of Absolutely. the concerto. So they take a they could take a one movement from one person's interpretation and another movement from another person's and you know create their own uh you know really and, and it's kind of funny because on the one hand there seemed to be this dichotomy in him between having control and giving up control. So that would be kind yeah. of the ultimate in giving up control. But in, in yeah. other ways, he, you know, just just by leaving the stage, he was asserting control 
over his creative process. And then by, you know, really focusing on the studio where, you know, he could edit and re-record, you know, take tunis, you know, to his heart, yeah. set his heart. Yeah. Player. Yeah, ab absolutely. You know, and there's been this, this myth that has sprung up that the reason Glenn did all of his recordings privately was because he re-recorded everything because he made lots of finger slips. It's all nonsense. You listen to, there are a fair amount of live recordings of Glenn um, that, um, that have survived. And, um, you know, he was a fantastic, fantastic pianist. And there are a couple of times where he does make mistakes in the live ones. And you can tell he's, very very angry with himself for making uh th there's a recording of the bach brandenburg five and he he's doing this absolutely glorious recording with detroit and he suddenly makes a slip in in the cadenza and he speeds up like wild just to, as if he's trying to escape what he's just done and it's a marvelous recording i hope it gets brought out someday because it's it's on youtube and it's it's amazing but make sure you listen to the detroit rather than the baltimore recording it's much better when glenn gave up the stage you know he gave up uh the ability to sort of present himself and his character you know his persona which was very famous and very controversial and really drew people in suddenly that whole uh and he considered it kind of circus-like but in a way yeah he kind of thrived on that on that uh ability to present himself in person and it was a big sacrifice for him uh well it was and it wasn't he actually detested the whole idea of touring he he thought that the whole idea of playing the same thing again and again caused a really bad sameness. He you know he he used to say he listened to a recording of his uh, um, box partita number no. five, which he'd just taken on tour, and he listened to the recording. And he says there are all sorts of bits of business there that are bound to wow everybody in a big hall, but really have nothing to do with the piece or what I think about the piece. Mm. So it's, you know, it's one of those unusual things because in some ways, yes, he he did want, it, it did take away some things and it certainly took away that physical presence of the artist. I think it's really worth sort of revisiting that time because there was, um, there was a feeling until that point that recording was to record a live performance it right. was to record a it was the document yes and if you did edits you were you were cheating you know and you were not yeah. as great a player and i think it glenn was really instrumental or certainly part of this wave of people who started to see uh recording as a an activity in itself and like you said an art form yeah yeah, very definitely. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right. Um, and, you know, he just decided that he was going to spend the rest of his life doing this. I was very, very lucky because Glenn and I became friends in a phone interview and we talked on the phone for a long time. But then right before the second Goldbergs uh, on Sony was going to come out. You know, there are actually two other Goldbergs. There's one on CBC that he did when he was really young. Mm. And there's a glorious version, which I sometimes like better than the two commercial versions that was recorded live in Salzburg about 1959. Huh. Um, but um, in any of that, I agreed to talk about the two different commercial recordings of the Goldbergs. And um, and I told him what I thought, and then he turned it into a little play, and he hired Tim Page to play Tim Page, saying things that Tim Page really believed, but had been put through the funnel of Gould's wonderful brain. And so that's how that got done. Um, and, uh, you know, we expected it would only be played once or twice in classical music, but then Glenn had his stroke only about a month after we recorded this. And uh, so all of a sudden it was, it was, you know, kind of a, a farewell recording. And I'm very glad that I met him. He was just as sweet and funny and childlike and 
interested in everything that you would you would expect from the Glenn Gould you imagine. And you know, he didn't see that many people, but he had very, very strong friendships with people uh, on, you know, on in the on the telephone and early on letters. He wrote a lot of letters. So it's it's just interesting, you know. He he found a way that he could live and function and not feel uncomfortable all the time. And you know, my attitude is more power to him. I mean, you you brought up something which I was going to ask you, which is, you know, was he Glenn Gould as as you knew him in person? Was there any sort of distance between you know, the character that everybody saw and the person that you spoke to on the phone or in person? Well, let me let me see if I can answer that correctly. I, I will say this. He was very much like he was on the phone, which were really wildly free-flung interviews and, and, and discussions because we became friends. And we would talk about everything from the late works of Richard Strauss to contrapuntal radio to Northern Canada to Bergman. We'd talk about a little bit of everything that, that you know, meant something to us. And it was interesting because I was up with Glenn for two full days, basically. Well, actually more like two full nights. Um, and it was interesting because before we started working on the play, he was very much as he had been before, very warm, very welcoming, very interested, very funny, engaging. But once we started actually making the recording, um, it was clear to me that asides were not welcomed and that we were working on this now and that we were taking it enormously seriously. So I was fine with that. And, and you know, we, we did, we recorded it really, really late. We started about 1 a.m., something mm -hmm. I can't even conceive of at the age of 67. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, and we recorded till dawn. Um, but, you know, when it was over, we were back to the friendliness, back to the happiness. And he even played a little piano for me, which was, um, I think I'm one of the younger people who's heard him live. I, I, I guess uh, certainly Richard Einhorn has, who helped record the the second Goldbergs. But uh, there are not many of us because he stopped playing when I was nine years old in front of a, you know, a live audience. Right. But it's interesting that you call that, I mean, I think it's kind of presented as an interview, but you call it a play. Um, well, no, we call it an interview, but it's in fact a play. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, we, we treated it as an interview and I was not a professional journalist at that point. I was writing here and there, but I was making most of my money on the radio and I didn't say anything in that that I didn't believe. There's some sort of corny bits of humor in there, which I went along with, which I had nothing to do with. And which I, if I had been in charge, I would have cut them out. <laughs> but, you know, it was part of Glenn and he wanted it his way. And, um, but I said, why don't we just talk about it? And Glenn was, oh, no, 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 we can't do that. So, but he did take my my ideas and he wrote them up into a play, basically. Um, it's not it's not spontaneous. It is it it is a legitimate document, but not a spontaneous legitimate document. It's not like the interview we're having now, where you know we're friends and we're talking about things, and if we go this way, we go. Glenn didn't want any of that. He didn't like that at all. <laughs> But it's interesting because it's, you know, he really approached it as an author, you know, just like, you know, he approached recording music as an author, you know, he yeah. had to control the process, even though he didn't need to splice, he didn't need to, you know, yeah. cheat, as anybody said, you know, uh, but at the same time, he wanted to control the voices and he even um, did at least one interview with himself uh video oh, well, and then on on paper as well right well he did them on paper i don't think he ever um actually 
did Glenn Gould answering a question and then or asking a question and then saying it immediately afterwards. He got somebody to stand in for those. Uh, okay. And 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 some of those were, I think, more spontaneous than ours was. Um, I think the one he did with his longtime producer, John McClure, in the mid 60s was was it may have been partially scripted, but I don't think it was as scripted as ours was. Humphrey Burton, he also did four TV shows with, which are marvelous. They're, they're maybe my favorite of his television work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there was at least discussion done beforehand, but um, I'm not sure how much of it was, um, was, was made it actually in exactly as it was supposed to be said. But I was playing myself too, you know. So it was you know, the the whole thing was unusual. I was young. I was very grateful for it. It brought me together with a man I admired enormously and also very much liked. And I'm very glad I had those, you know, last couple of days with him because, you know, and I almost didn't go, but I'd gotten my first American Express card and I decided, well, I can put this on my card. And so I flew up. <laughs> To, uh Canada it was great and did he you know thinking about that whole theme about authorship did he express any desire to be an author or to to write more I know he did write obviously a lot of the essays in your book um do you think he had the aspiration to write a book or do something bigger well you know we had talked about the idea of a book and he He's, as I recall, and there are a number of things besides just the fact that it's 40 years that uh, make my brain a little bit unsure of itself. <laughs> but um, he, um, we did talk about the idea of doing a book. We actually talked about it a couple of times. And he, you know, he thought that it was not yet time for a summing up. Um, he did compose, as I think you know, he did a string quartet and he did some choral pieces and some piano pieces. And, you know, they're, um, they're interesting, but they're not really as inspired as, as the things that he would do, you know, when he was recording or actually for that matter, writing about music. I would much rather uh, read his writings about music than I would actually to listen to the rather long and Brucknerian string quartet that he wrote. Bruck, Bruckner meets Schoenberg, I would say. It's it's like meets early Schoenberg. And it's fine. You know, it's a, it's a perfectly solid for string quartet. And he called it Opus One. So um, I guess he intended to have some other opuses, but he, he got busy with other things. What was the book going to be? An autobiography, or I, I don't think that. Um, I think it was going to be a larger book about um, about music, and I I can't say at all what it was. We didn't talk in any great detail. I was just trying to get him interested in the fact that um, you know, in, in the idea of publishing his thoughts together, you know, mm. I, I'm one of these people who believes very strongly in books. Even now, you know, um, I, 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 you know, and, and it was, it was also, um, you know, at least for me, it was also kind of a careerist thing on my part, because I thought, we got along so well that we could work together and then I would bring out a book. And of course it turned out that I would bring out a book, but Glenn was not there to do it. Um, and, you know, um, I mean, my whole life has just been suddenly getting a crazy idea and doing it. And this was one of my better ones <laughs> and I <laughs> continued to do it. And people say, no, no, but you're a music critic. Well, I am, but I'm also doing this. And I also believe that for anybody, even now, who wants to say to the world, and I'm, I'm sort of talking about me, but I'm also talking about Glenn, I want to be taken seriously as a thinker. I think uh, putting a book together is just a good idea in general, because, you know, I know of a lot of marvelous critics, and we don't remember them because there isn't that book, which brings some of their best work together. Um, and I think it's unfortunate. Um, nowadays, they're not printing many 
books of essays, unfortunately. But one thing that you and I have discussed as well in the past about Glenn, you know, you wrote your own book, Parallel Play, about your undiagnosed Asperger's syndrome, which you found out about, you know, in your 40s, I think. 45, and, yeah. And you have said that you thought Glenn also probably was on the spectrum somehow. What what about him sort of tells you that? Well, that's that was not my idea because there had already been a book by Peter Ostwald um, about Glenn, which talked about Asperger's syndrome, which is now generally included just with the autistic spectrum as mm -hmm. instead of sitting by itself, which I think is wise, actually. Okay. Um, but then there was a librarian um, in Ottawa who wrote a book called Was Glenn Gould Autistic? Uh, and it's 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 not a real full book. As I recall, it's about 25, 30 pages. But it was interesting. And it came out, I don't know, sometime in the, I want to say late 80s, early 90s, something like that, maybe even later than that. But it's fascinating. And I've talked to a lot of the people who knew Glenn, most of whom are now gone. And they all also thought that this was um, a character trait of his because he was unusual you know he was he was very shy about some things he had he had a lot of different phobias he was anxious in certain so social circumstances he also had a brain which was just concentrating on what interested him and if something didn't interest him he couldn't learn it and I was diagnosed because um, my son, I didn't say this with parallel play, had this to an extreme degree mm -hmm. and we were getting him appointments and he's now an adult and he acknowledges it and, you know, even talks about it. He, he was not an adult when he was diagnosed, but the therapist at that point said, you have this too. And all of a sudden, it was extraordinary to look at my life and look at the the remarkable things I did as a young kid, but I also flunked everything, you know, and I was inept in so many ways. And it was just, it, you know, it was one of these brains that could concentrate on something fiercely, ferociously, and to the, um, to the, um, to to ignore everything else um and you know i think that's one of the reasons glenn and i liked each other you know we um we were on each other's wavelength completely when we were talking we you know we were interested in the same things you know sometimes people say oh well if he's autistic i'll introduce this person to somebody else who is autistic and usually that doesn't work because autism is a very varied and interesting condition or state or whatever we want to call it. And if you bring somebody together who loves old records with somebody whose passion is, you know, the, the crowned heads of Europe's and their dates or, or vacuum tubes or something like that, what you'll have is two monologues. But if you get two people who are autistic, um, together talking about something that we absolutely love, then that's very different because it's just like, my God, I found my brother. You know? And we start just talking and talking and, and interrupting each other. Ah, da, 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 you know, and that's the way it was with, with Glenn and me. We would just talk for hours and hours and hours at a time. And of course, I kick myself for not having recorded these, but you don't record your conversations with friends no, that's just no. not something you can do no. with any legitimacy as far as i'm concerned and so you know there's all this stuff which i you know i can remember if somebody brings something up i'll get a little memory of glenn which is one reason why i like having these talks but you know it was not something i could have done however that would have been a marvelous book because we talked about a lot of different things and always had a very good time but it seems like, um, you know, personal things were not things that he wanted to talk about, like his family or his, you know, whatever was going on with him emotionally. That's not something he really shared 
Not usually. I mean, he he talked about some things, but yeah, he kept he kept that part of his life pretty private, you know. And and to, how do I put this? Um, I don't think that that part of his life was necessarily what he considered the most important. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was more interested in what he was doing than he was was in his personal life and he he definitely did have you know several women in his life you know and he's you know they've talked about it um and um so you know it uh, it it it's not as though he didn't have some of the usual things that we had um, that, that most people have in a lifetime, but it wasn't what he thought was his best work, his most important work. He, you know, considered his work sort of paramount, you know, and you often do find that with people on the spectrum or, or for that matter, just with geniuses in general, they're, they're not normal guys exactly although on the other hand he was so funny and and warm when he wanted to be one more thing i want to talk to you about sure is, uh you know his whole interest that you mentioned earlier in contrapuntal radio um and he did this trilogy the solitude trilogy yes which in a lot of ways is is like a kind of a composition using spoken word um and what do you think? And he did other documentaries in that same style. What he certainly saw it as a composition. He, he did, yeah. Yeah. But again, yeah. there's he, sort of like that overlap between authorship, being an author in, in a way, because he's constructing a story out of words. But at the same time, it's it's a musical thing as well. It's a sound thing. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you see that as, as a, one of his primary outlets and, and sort of storytelling in a way um i i do see it as a important part of of what he was doing and he definitely saw it as he saw it as music he also saw it as a documentary he used to call it contrapuntal radio right. um and so he was you know that was Im important to him and that was definitely a side um you know, part part of what he was about. So, yeah. And what what do you think about? I mean, obviously, solitude was an incredibly rich topic for him. Um, but he he really wanted to explore it through other people's voices and and sort of creating this overlap. So it's kind of a challenge to figure out what's what the story is in a way. Because he's kind of guiding your attention, but at the same time, he's not. Does that make sense? Yeah, but I, I've i always thought that if somebody on one of those recordings said something that he did not think fit into his image of what he was doing, he would have cut it out. So as the editor and as, as a very firm editor, I would have to say that the people who were saying things there were saying things that he believed and was interested in. Um, it's funny because, you know, I admire those and I find them very, very interesting in many, many ways. And for me, they're not particularly musical. You know, I hear the, I'm interested in the people then and the sound then and the idea of aloneness then, but I don't hear a lot of music in them the way some people do. And people have written books about those. And Glenn certainly thought they were very musical. But then who am I? I'm somebody who really genuinely likes an MRI if I know that I'm going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, for me, that's very musical. It's like, you know, it, it's like some kind of super hyper ultra minimalism. And for yeah, me, yeah. at least if I know I'm not going to find out something horrible when they put me in that tube, I enjoy it. So, you know, it's we all weird. we all find our weird music in different ways. It's a Philip Glass uh, piece, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, is there any? Oh, Glenn couldn't heard? stand the minimalists. We might add that in there. So, we had a different response to, um, to um, to music on certain levels. On the other hand, we certainly uh, 
understood and felt late Richard Strauss with the same heart, you know. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that we haven't discussed about Glenn or Glenn's story that, I mean, obviously we can't cover everything, but anything specific that comes to mind that you, you think we should close with? I can't really think of anything. I, I will say this. Um, one thing Glenn very definitely believed in um, was posterity. Um, and I believe in it too. Um, although it's certainly smacking me in the face a lot these days. And I'm sometimes thinking, who really finally cares? Mm -hmm. But it meant a lot to Glenn to do things to the best of his ability and to leave some trace of himself that would still be on the planet beyond writing. He was interested in film. He was interested in music. And I think that meant a lot to him. And I think Glenn would be very pleased that you know 40 years later that people are giving lectures on him that you're doing what i consider a wonderful interview dave i, I thank you so much for it thank you. um and that people still care and people are still kind of figuring him out and they're finding things that glenn did that lead them on in their own way um and um so so I think, I think I could guess that, you know, Glenn would be very pleased with the fact that people are still interested and they're interested in him the way he wanted them to be interested. They're not just interested in the fact that he could play anything incredibly fast and, you know, which he could, we have lots of evidence of that, but that's not really what it's all about with Glenn. I mean, it's, part of it but it's not all of it and um you know i'm i'm just glad that you know the the glenn gould story goes on and i so appreciate you asking these questions about my friend all these years later the story talks back is produced and hosted by dave stanton the music you're hearing now was written and performed by christopher daydream the theme music at the beginning of our show is an excerpt from Play by Merlin Twelfthoven, performed by Kronos Quartet as part of their 50 for the Future series. Please subscribe to the Story Talks Back on Podbean and check us out on Instagram. See you next time.